You could maybe even just hold it up to your camera if you've got it there, and I can try to take a screen capture or something. Um, so first, before we get started, um, thanks everybody for coming. I do want you to see, oh, this is the wrong semester, that's why everything's here. Um, as of last class, people were asking, right, because we talked about with the refrigeration cycles that we may have to, or you may have the opportunity to fix the states graphically. So if that's something that you're inclined to do, if you feel like that takes you less time than, um, than fixing them in the textbook, um, I put up this pH diagram, which is the same like we talked about in class for how to fix states. If there is a question on uh, refrigeration units that um, I give you the option to use a pH diagram to fix the states for, then you can use this graph. So if you want to print this out beforehand, so you're not kind of scrambling during the exam to print stuff out, um, feel free to print this out. If you need a pH diagram, this will be the one that you have. In this same sort of tab under contents, table of contents, online exam materials, uh, pH, or, right, you also have in this same sort of bin or folder, there's also the thermodynamic tables. This is the one that has the imperial and the SI units, SI units in green, right? And then imperial units are sort of grayed out down here. And then what I'll be using today when we do this class is the equation sheet, right? So as you can say, we've had this equation sheet for a long time, but um, I think this is a good sheet. Uh, maybe that's because I'm the one that made it, but I think it's, um, you know, everything is organized here, right? We've got conservation of mass, the first law for closed and open systems, the second law for closed and open systems, right? The rate equation is probably what we'll use most times. In closed systems, we'll often have the work is equal to the integral of PDV, but we need to know PV to the N, right? If it's a polytropic process, we need some pressure volume relationship. There's some stuff about performance metrics. So characterizing cycles and individual components. I think the thing that's really um, important here, right? So I guess subcooled liquid, sometimes people forget ideal pumps, how to do ideal pumps, right? So V delta P. Um, but the ideal gas section, I think a lot of people sometimes forget about, right? So here, this is where particularly if we have isentropic processes, right, which are always the key to solving um, cycles like we'll do today, right? Uh, the Brayton cycle where it's an ideal gas, Right? We need to know if it's constant specific heat, I'm going to pick one of these expressions with K in the exponent. Typically, closed systems, I'll know volume ratio, so I'll use this equation. And open systems, I know pressure ratio, so I'll use this equation. And then if it's a um, variable specific heat problem, we'll use either the ratio of pressures is equal to the ratio of PRs, or the VR ratio is equal to the volume ratio. Right? And again, open systems typically pressures Closed systems, typically volumes, right? So as you're studying for the exam, and there's some suggested exam problems just to go over different cycles, if you look on the syllabus, um, you know, ha have a look when you go through it with the uh, equation sheet, because even if you're making your own equation sheet, I do think the layout of this equation sheet hopefully helps you figure out, um, you know, where to look. Um, the other thing, so today our plan is the Brayton cycle, some sort of uh, hopefully difficult Brayton cycle, right? So you can see that we can use this same process we've been talking about, even on problems where we haven't necessarily seen it before. Tomorrow, our plan is to do a turbojet engine, but we don't yet have plans for Thursday and Friday. So if, does anybody have a preference for what other cycles will be uh you would like to go over in these review sessions typically we can do about one cycle per day so the other options are rankin so something difficult with rankin rankin you can get more complexity right but it's probably the one we're the most familiar with because we've done a lot of rankin cycles um we can do vapor compression refrigeration which um is typically um 
typically the same. You get different input parameters, but I mean, we don't know about increasing the complexity of that cycle. It's going to be those, those four components for refrigerators and um, uh, heat pumps. And then there's also internal combustion engines. Here I have a picture of a diesel uh, engine, but uh, we could do an auto cycle too, although diesel cycle is a little more complicated. So um, looks like here we have an open feed water heater, so a Rankin cycle and uh, an auto, or I would personally, I would recommend diesel over auto because I think if you can do a diesel cycle, you can do an auto cycle, but it's not necessarily true the other way. Does that sound good to people? Maybe we tried to do a Rankin problem and an internal combustion engine problem. Does anybody have any? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's just in the same SNP. Yeah, well, that's, uh, we could do that. Um, but again, I think that diesel tends to be more difficult. Um, we might be able to try to do both, but I would try, I, I think it would be better to do diesel, but if people would prefer to do auto, that that's okay with me too. So how about we try this one on Thursday. And then we can think about, we'll do some kind of internal combustion engine on Friday. Oops, let's pretend that I can spell. It's a bit of a stretch. Um, right, so does someone want to volunteer to bring in a rank and cycle problem that looks complicated? Hopefully one that's got lots of different things. Maybe, you know, even though this is complicated, right? But one that's maybe even got, you know, reheat and regeneration, right? Or maybe multiple reheats or something. Just something that looks like, you, you know, you're looking for the scariest picture in the textbook. The one where if you open the, the exam, it'd be like, oh, wow, I didn't think you could ask me something like that. Um, because I want to try to show you that even the scary ones we can do if we kind of relax and trust the process. Does anyone want to volunteer to find a ranking problem for Thursday? Well, we can table it for now, but by the end of the class, hopefully we'll have someone uh, to volunteer to try to find a problem from the textbook that looks, looks tough. So, um, today, we're going to talk about Brayton cycles, right? So Brayton cycles, uh, this is the model for the natural gas power plant, which is uh, certainly on the rise here in uh, the U.S. And part of the reason for our um, decline, well, first for, uh, you know, so our growing energy independence and for the decline of emissions here in the U.S. Um, now, we talked about that there are downsides too, like any sort of power generation cycle. Um, we got to get the natural gas out of the ground, right? So certainly there's um, some issues with fracking that, you know, like I said, lots of engineers are trying to trying to solve that problem right now. So, um, do we have the problem, Dan? I don't know if you're able to send me. Maybe you. Yeah, it's it's getting there. Everything's taking a while to load. Okay. Um, I have it up on my phone, and I am typing out the. I'm sending it in an email right now. Cool. So hopefully. So while you're doing that, maybe I'll just talk briefly about. Um, Brayton cycle. So I like to try to think about all these cycle problems as the same problem, right? So the first question that I ask, right, when I do any of these cycle problems is how do I characterize the cycle? So this is a heat engine. So we burn stuff to get power, right? So we talk about thermal efficiency, right? This is the energy benefit over the energy cost, right? But the energy benefit is going to be net power divided by heat transfer rate in, right? This is going to be the sum of all, oops, of all the turbine powers plus the sum of all the pump powers. Or in this case, they're compressors because as we'll see to the answer to our third problem, the working fluid is ideal gases. And then we want to divide by the sum of all the places that we add heat, right? Now, the trick here, right, is that these values are positive. I hate when it does that. And these values here are negative, right? So these, I'm getting my expression for W dot from the first law. 
So for both of these, if we can make the assumptions we usually make, it will be something like m dot times h in minus h out. And the first law will figure out the signs for me so I don't have to try to flip the delta h for turbines and compressors. My next question is, is it open or closed? And this is a series of open systems, right? So that means we'll use conservation of mass, right? So uh, dm by dt is equal to the sum of m dot in minus the sum of m dot out. We'll have de by dt is equal to q dot minus w dot plus the sum of m dot in with some stuff minus the sum of m dot out, again, with some stuff in here. And we'll have ds by dt is equal to q dot over t of the surroundings plus the sum of m dot in s in minus the sum of m dot out s out. So anytime it's an open cycle or a, a cycle that consists of a series of open processes, these are the equations that we'll use. And then we go through and we make some assumptions about what's going on. Now, what's the fluid? The fluid is air or something like it, right? So it's some kind of ideal gas. So that means, right, the reason we ask this question, so this is, it comes to when we're gonna fix the states. Cause until we fix the states and start getting numbers, it really doesn't matter what the fluid is, right? Cause the first law doesn't care what the fluid is until you start putting in values for H, right? Or S or whatever equation you're using, right? So here, this means we can use the ideal gas law, but it also means we need to know, so the key is find the processes where delta S is equal to zero, right? In this case, specifically for Brayton, this is gonna be ideal turbines and compressors. Right, so it's going to be the ones that, oh, so there's where there's no Q dot, right? Or where uh, Q dot is equal to zero. Those are the, the processes where we're going, and work survives. Those are the processes where we're going to be using delta S is equal to zero. So here, right, this also means because it's an ideal gas, right, we have to ask ourselves, is it going to be constant specific heat or variable specific heat? Right? And if it's constant specific heat, we know we're going to have a bunch of delta S's or delta H's, right? So delta H is going to be CP times delta T, right? And we'll be looking for an equation with K in the exponent because I'll probably know um, pressure ratios. So if I have um, some outlet temperature and some inlet temperature, that will be equal to uh, P2 over P1 to the power of K minus 1 over K if delta S is equal to zero, right? For variable specific heat, uh, delta H is equal to delta H, and we'll get that from table A22. And if delta S is equal to zero, then we're going to probably use P1 over P2 is equal to PR1 over PR2. So that's kind of, it gives me the framework, I think. When I answer these three questions, it lets me know how I'm going to solve the problem, right? And the other uh, cycles, the same thing. If I can answer those three questions, I'll also know how to solve the problem, right? So it might not mean exactly that I get all the right answers, right? But it does mean that I'll have some idea of what to do, right? Okay, so now we have a question over here. Hopefully it's going to work. Oh, it looks like it's probably a pretty big picture, so it's taking a second here. It um it does reference another problem, but I don't believe I don't think that should be an issue. That's I think okay. it we'll gives you all out. the information. Okay. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this a little differently. Um, now I'm all snapped. Oh, 
Oh, it's nice. It's an Imperial 2, which always makes life... You know, you, you should expect problems in metric and Imperial on the final, just like the other exams. Right, so air enters the compressor of an air standard regenerative gas turbine at P1 with some pressure and some temperature. With a mass flow rate given, the compressor pressure ratio is 10, the turbine inlet temperature is something, and the regenerator effectiveness is 80%. Find the thermal efficiency, right? So here, if I'm reading this correctly, we have... So we got air coming in here at state one. It goes into a compressor. Now it says that there's some regeneration, right? So in Brayton, regeneration looks something like this, right? So regeneration means before it goes to the combustor, we scavenge some heat from the exhaust, right? So this would be state two after the compressor. State three is after the regenerator on this, the cold side. And then we have some combustor, right? And we come out of the combustor here at state four. Now we're going to go into our turbine. Now we come out of the turbine. Now, normally without regeneration, this would just go into the, um, into the environment, right? But because we're being good stewards of the uh, environment, well, Oh, looking after our bottom line, we're going to go through this regenerator, get to state six, and this will be our outlet. Right? And then it says, okay, so this was determine the thermal efficiency net power developed for each of the following configurations that build on six points. So, right, so this is the general, I think, um, process, right? So now, all right, so we could solve this one, but it seems like we're going to talk a little bit about how this could get trickier, right? So introduce a two-stage compression with intercooling between the compressors, right? So that would mean that in between the compressors here, we would come and we'd cool, right? And then we'd go through another compressor before coming out into the regenerator. Each compressor has an interrupting efficiency, is 88, and then introduce a two-stage expansion with reheat in between. So now, instead of going to five, we would come over here and we'd have reheat come over here and now a second turbine over here. And then this would be what would go in to the, into the regenerator. Right, so how should we solve this? Should we try to get, there's a couple ways we can do this. I can just do the most complicated one here at the end, or I can kind of step through it, and maybe, maybe it's, I can try to get equations for the base case, and then maybe for the most complicated case. How does that sound? And we'll see how it's different, but how following the same process still helps us, um, you know, do the problem, right? So we want to find the thermal efficiency, right? And net power develop. But I mean, you always need the net power develop just to get the thermal efficiency. So we will do first the base case. So case one, right? So first thing that I want to do is I want to find a uh, symbolic solution for the thermal efficiency, right? So I know that the thermal efficiency is going to be the sum of all the turbine powers, oops, W dot T, plus the sum of all the compressor powers divided by the sum of all the places where we add heat in. The good news here, though, in the base case, we have one compressor, one turbine, and one place where we're adding heat. Right, so here we have, this is going to be W dot of T1, right, it's the only turbine, we'll call this T1, right, and this one could be T2, um, plus W dot of C1, this is compressor 1, divided by, oops, Q dot 
of the boiler, or, or it's not a boiler because it's not liquid, right? So of the combustible. So this is great. I got an equation for thermal efficiency, right? It doesn't really help me answer the problem though, because this is good. It's a good first step, but I've got an equation that has four unknowns in it, and I don't know any of them, right? So that's bad. So what I do is, you know, in thermal, when we get stuck, we use the first law. Right, so we know that this is dE by dt is equal to q dot minus w dot plus the sum of m dot in h in plus this is a metric, this is an imperial problem. So even though we're going to end up canceling it out, I'm still going to say v in squared over 2gc plus g over gc times z in minus the sum of m dot out h out plus v out squared over 2gc plus g over gc z out, right? So there are some assumptions I'm going to make for every component. So for all, uh, well, at least every component here. So all T's, compressors, and combustors, right? They're all going to be steady state. They're all one in and one out. And for all of them, uh, the change in the kinetic energy is about zero, which is about equal to the change in the potential energy. So I get rid of these terms, right? Which is nice because those are the tough terms, right? We'll see tomorrow when we do the turbojet that uh, we can't always get rid of those things. Then we'll say for the turbines, we will say that they are adiabatic, right? So if it was a turbine, then this would be adiabatic. And also, that's true if it's a compressor. But if it's a combustor, we will say that it's passive. So what this means is for turbines and compressors, we're going to find that W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. And then for combustors, oops, Q dot is going to be M dot times H out minus H in. So now when I go back, my thermal um, efficiency, right, was going to be the turbine power M dot times H. The turbine is going to be H4 minus H5. Plus the compressor power, m dot times h1 minus h2. Now remember, I'm assuming the turbine is going to be a positive power and the compressor is going to be a negative power. So I'm still adding these two things together. This is the thing people get wrong pretty, you know, reasonably often on exams, right? And that's why the, the textbook tells us that pumps and compressors are like h out minus h in, but I don't like thinking that way because then I can't get that equation from the first law, right? So if you want to put a subtraction sign here, you have to only be thinking about magnitudes, right? So if you're adding them up, a way to do this is your, your net power, which is the top, right? So this is w dot net. It asks that for, uh, from us in the problem. w dot net is the numerator here. Your net power always has to be less than your turbine power, right? Because your compressors are not producing power. Now the combustor, this is going to be m dot. If we go up to our picture, H out minus H in. So the combustor H out is state four and H in is state three. Right, um, I think they tell us the mass flow rate, but uh, like I said, I'm really good at putting numbers into my calculator wrong. So why put it in the numerator and the denominator? Because I can factor it out of both and drop it out, right? So now I just have H four minus H five plus H one minus H two divided by H four minus H three. This is going to be my thermal efficiency, right? Now, if Professor Schertzer on the exam asked me to assume constant specific heat, then this equation would change, right? Because if it's constant specific heat, then what happens is delta H becomes Cp times delta T, right? So then this would become Cp 
times t4 minus t5 plus t1 minus t2 divided by cp t4 minus t3. And again, I'm great at putting things wrong in my calculator, so I'm happy to cancel out that CP value. So if it's variable specific heat, I need to find all the enthalpies. But if it's constant specific heat, well, then I only need to find the temperatures, right? Temperatures and pressures. So now I'm going to talk about... I think it's probably more valuable, just in case we run out of time, for me to go through and tell you how I would fix these states than to go through. And if we had the more complicated one, all that happens is we have two turbines, two compressors, and two places where we're adding heat. So we just get a couple more terms, but the numerator terms are still all m dot times h in minus h out, and the denominator terms are all m dot times h out minus h in. So now I'm gonna to try to talk you through how I would fix these states, right? So um, first I'm gonna to try to make a state table here. So we have, right, one through six. Maybe I'll try to redraw this uh, just so I can. We have state one, go into a compressor, then into a regenerator then into a combustor, then into a turbine, and then the exhaust comes out over here. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, in my head, I'm already thinking, oh, this is right, because when I answered my three questions, this was ideal gas, right? And I know for ideal gas is the most important thing for me to be able to solve um, the whole cycle is to know where I can get a process where delta S is equal to zero, right? So I can go through this compressor from state one to two S, and I can go through this turbine from state four to state five S. So those are gonna be the ones, that's gonna be the key for me solving how to, um, how to do this particular uh, cycle right, when I'm trying to get numbers. So I'm gonna have one, two S, two, state three, state four, state five S, state five, and then state six. Man, I don't know. I'm not good at drawing straight lines on the board, but I think I might be even worse at drawing straight lines on this uh, pad. So you have to bear with me over here. So. Here's my state table, or at least my reasonable approximation of a state table. I think for one where you'd have this many states, I would give you a state table. It's not going to be full, right? Oh, maybe in a multiple choice question, it would be full. But, um, you know, not in, a, uh, um, not in a long answer problem. It would be partially full. So you'd get more information than you probably would in a textbook question. Because the textbook questions take kind of a long time to do. So we'll need to know the temperature. We'll need to know the pressure. Um, if it's variable specific heat, we probably also want to know PR. We probably also want to know H. If we had a second law part of the question, which we don't in this one, we might also want to know S superscript zero because we can't just look up S, right? So here in the original problem, it says air enters the compressor at P1, so here we know P1, and we know T1, with a mass flow rate, maybe I'd have an M dot here. I know the mass flow rate, and it's gonna be the same in all these components. The compressor pressure ratio is 10, so this means that this is going to be 10 times P1. This is also going to be 10 times P1. Right, so the compress so here, where is it 10 times P1? All the way through here, right, until we go down in pressure across the turbine, right? So everywhere till state five. So this is also gonna be 10 times P1, 10 times P1, state five. Now we've gone through the turbine. Now this is eventually gonna get exhausted out to the atmosphere, 
right? And there's just heat transfer that happens. So this is constant pressure from five to six, which is gonna be the same as P1. So this is P1, P1, P1. And this, this, well, this is the one that was given, right? But I can fill this out. And this they kind of gave to me, although not explicitly. But I can fill the rest of this stuff out just from knowing those two things. So it says the compressor pressure ratio is 10. The turbine inlet temperature, that's state four, is given. So that's um, 220 degrees rank. And the other thing here, because this is imperial, well, even if it's not, I want these temperatures in absolute temperatures. I do that anytime I'm dealing with an ideal gas because if I use the ideal gas law and if I use those expressions with K in the exponent, none of those things have a delta T in them. They're all a temperature that stands alone. So I just make my life easier right from the beginning and I turn everything into, um, I turn everything into absolute temperature. So Rankin in this case, but Calvin if it was metric. So the, and then they tell us the regenerator efficiency is equal to 80%, but I'm just gonna write down 0 0.8 over here. Determine the thermal efficiency in the power development, right? So we gotta remember what the regenerator efficiency means, right? So this is, I can look on my equation sheet. What does the equation sheet actually say? Let's, I'll bring it up over here. The equation sheet, right? So this is a characterized or a performance metric right? So it's an, equa an efficiency for a, oh, is it not here? It should be here. Turbine pump and compression regenerator. The actual uh, regeneration, the heat transfer, right? Divided by the maximum regeneration heat transfer, right? So this regeneration heat transfer it's talking about is this that's going here, right? So here I can talk about, right? this uh, regenerator heat. So what is the actual heat that's transferred? And what is the maximum heat that could be transferred, right? So the actual is from two to three, but the maximum would be as if we could take two and get all the way up to state five, which is the hottest part in the regenerator. We'll talk about that as we get to that state when we start to fix that state. Okay, so now what do we do, right? So we got to decide if we do constant or variable specific heat, right? Constant or variable specific heat. I'm going to try to do it both ways. Um, it probably means that we'll take a little bit more time than we have. Um, but again, I'll post the video if you uh, want to see this, right? So constant specific heat or variable specific heat. I'll do constant specific heat on the left and variable specific heat on the right. So state one. For constant specific heat, all we want to know is temperature and pressure. For variable specific heat, we're going to want to know temperature, pressure. Um, we probably want to know uh, PR, and we also want to know H, right? So this is more work. This takes more time, right? So here we're going to need table A22. Here we don't, but we're going to need uh, K and CP, right? That's how we're going to fix this stuff. Good news is for state one over here, I already know the temperature and the pressure. So this one's done. For state one over here, I need to take the temperature and go to table A22. And then I'll look up my temperature. So A22, right, it looks like, uh, I don't know what I was trying to draw there. It's just a hand spasm. Uh, A22, right, it's got a temperature. It's got um, H probably got U on there somewhere, uh, P, R, B, R, S superscript zero, right? There's two ways to do this, right? When I know the temperature, right, I start here and I pick off H and I pick off P, R, I go this way. But then in some other states, I'm going to know P, R and I'm going to move this way and I'm going to pick off H and I'm going to pick off the temperature. So um, here, because I know the temperature, this is like one of these blue ones, I'm gonna take this temperature to table A22 and I'm gonna find H1 and I'm gonna find uh, PR1. Now, state two, I would like to go to state two, but I can't. 
right? Here, they must have told me the compressor efficiencies. Um, maybe I erased the, I closed my inbox. Uh, here it says the, uh, and the regenerator effectiveness is 80%. The compressor pressure ratio is the inlight turbine. Oh, so it says each compressor has an isotropic efficiency of 84% and the turbine has an 88%. So the compressor is going to be 84% efficient and the turbine is going to be 88% efficient, right? So ultimately, when I get here to get state two, I'm going to use the um, compressor efficiency, right? Compressor efficiency is going to have the um, it's the ideal compressor that uses less power than the real compressor. This is going to be M dot times H in is state one, H out is state two S divided by M dot H one minus H two, right? And then because this is a constant specific heat problem on this side, uh, these are going to drop out, right? And that's just going to come straight over to here. But uh, this would become... Uh, the CP T1 minus T2S divided by CP T1 minus T2. So here I know the compressor efficiency. I don't need to know CP, although it's for air, it's usually about one. I know T1, but I don't know T2S. and I don't know T2, right? So if I was doing this and I started looking for state two first, I would see that I can't solve state two. So then I have to find state two S first, right? And this is why, you know, delta S is equal to zero is really important, right? So here next, I'm gonna find two S. But first I'll come up here to the variable specific heat side. This is gonna be essentially the same thing I'm going to have H1 minus H2S over H1 minus H2. Uh, I don't know uh, H2 or 2S. I was given the compressor efficiency and I know it's right. So it's the same thing, right? I got one equation, but two unknowns. So I got to find state 2S. So here from 1 to 2S, this is a process where delta S is equal to zero. Right, so now I break out my equation sheet and I say that, right, so I look for, we're looking for isentropic ideal gas equations, right? I want one where I know the pressures and K is in the exponent. So this is going to be T2S over T1 is equal to P2 over P1 to the K minus 1 over K. Now in this equation, I don't know T2S. I do know T1. I guess I don't necessarily, they didn't tell me P2, right? But this is R, the compressor pressure ratio, right? And I know K. So from here, I get T2S, and then I put T2S into this equation, and now I know T2, right? So, it's probably faster if you just realize that you need to do the isentropic outlet first. But if you don't, that's okay. Because if you try to do the real outlet, you'll see you don't have enough information. And you'll see one of the things that you need is the isentropic outlet. It's pretty similar, T2S in variable specific heat. But now you're going to use, you can't use the equation with K in the exponent because that assumes constant specific heat, right? Because K is CP over CV. So here, you're going to have to go P1 over P2 is equal, well, actually, let's do P2S over P1 is equal to PR2S over PR1. So from here, right, you know this, this is again R, PR1 we found over here. So from here, we find PR2S. Now, this is like the red case over here, where now we know PR2S. I find that on table 822, and I get H2S, and I can find T2S if I want. Um, but on an exam, 
maybe you just get H2S from table A22. Right? But you could find T2S as well. If you needed to use like the ideal gas law in between states, then you'd need the temperature. So that's state 2S, right? And state 2, right? Because now once we know H2S, then we put that in here, and then we get H2, right? So now what do we do? We go to state 3, right? So state 3, here we need to know something about the regenerator efficiency. So state 3. So what's common, right? So here we want to know the regenerator efficiency, right? This is uh, Q dot actual over Q dot um, max. So um, because we're going to say that uh, this regenerator, uh, when we're looking at each individual side, only one side, this is going to be the same assumptions as the combustor, right? So both of these Q dot terms are going to be M dot H out minus H in. And we're going to look on the cold side, right? Um, so this is going to be here on the side that's going into the combustor, because that's the side we really care about. How much preheating are we going to get? So the outlet state is state three and the inlet state is state two. And the maximum that state three could approach is state five. So this is going to be, uh, well, I can cancel out the M dots. So this is going to be, uh, what did I say? The outlet in the real case is state three minus state two over H five minus H two. And that's gonna be the uh, expression that I have just for my variable specific heat. Uh, it's going to be uh, H three minus H two divided by H five minus H two. Right now, the good news here is I know the regenerator efficiency and I know state two the bad news is uh, I don't know either of these two guys. If I was doing this in constant specific heat, this equation essentially looks the same, but uh, it just becomes the regenerator efficiency is going to be Cp T3 minus T2 divided by Cp times uh, T5 minus T2. These t uh, Cps are going to drop out. And it's the same story where I know T2 and I know the uh, regenerator efficiency, but I don't know T3 and T5. Oops, these are X's. So I'm a bit stuck. I can't do anything here. So if you get stuck, go back to your state table and see what information you have, right? And this will happen in these kind of regenerative Brayton cycles. That state three, you kind of usually get stuck at because you don't know state five yet. The good news is, if you get stuck, you look for some other place where you know a temperature and a pressure, right? So here at state four, we know the temperature and the pressure. So I'm not done with state three yet, but I'm hoping that, so we're going to come back here. We're going to hope that we can do the rest of the problem and get state five. And then when we know state five, we'll know state three. Right, so we're going back to the turbine. So this will usually happen in these Brayton problems where they'll tell me the temperature at the inlet of the turbine. Sometimes they tell me in, in a tricky way, maybe they'll say like the maximum temperature in the cycle. Right, so that's this one. So um, state four is kind of like state one, where um, here, if we're doing constant specific heat, we already know the temperature and the pressure, so we're done state four, right? But if we're doing variable specific heat, we have to, just like we did in blue, right? We take that we know T4, and we go to table A22, and I can interpolate to find H4, and then if I want it, I can, I no, I'm definitely going to also need PR4, right? So... So now we have this state at the beginning of the turbine. And the good news about that is the turbine, you doing the turbine is kind of like doing the compressor, right? We have a potentially ideal outlet and we have a real outlet. So I'm going to say that I didn't learn my lesson when I did the compressor and I'm going to try to go straight to state five. 
right, looks like I'll add a page or two here. How does it always this? <laughs> it's not the tool's fault, it's my fault. I don't know how to bring this up. Um, so we're going to go to state five over here. So for five, we know the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, right? And the turbine isentropic efficiency, what is the re or the ideal turbine produces more power than the real turbine. Right? We've already done our assumptions for the turbine, and we see that these that the power here is m dot times h in minus h out, and h in is state four, and h out is state five, right? Or m to, in the ideal case, h four minus h five s. Mass flow rates cancel out, and if it was constant specific heat, right? Then over here, this would become our turbine efficiency would be equal to CP times T4 minus T5 divided by CP times T4 minus T5S. Right? And these are going to cancel. So uh, again, the good news here is that we know uh, T4, we know H4. We also know the turbine efficiency. The bad news is I don't know T5 and I don't know T5S. If this happens to you on the exam, remember that the key for all of these ideal gas processes is to use the relationships for isentropic processes. So you have to find the processes that have delta S is equal to zero. So that happens when you go between state five and state five S. I'm gonna go up here. Sorry, I, I get that this is uh, maybe a little bit confusing. So now if we get to of state 5s, right? So yeah, going from 4 to 5s, uh, delta s is equal to 0, right? So now, if it's constant specific heat, we're going to say, just like when we went to state 2s, we're going to say that T5s over T4 is equal to P5s, which is the same as P1, divided by P4, which is the same as P2, to the K minus one over K. In this case, right, we, uh, we're trying to find T5S, because if we could find T5S, then we could solve the problem, right? Or at least we could get to state five, right? So now we know T4. Um, this is now going to be one over R, and we know K. So the only thing we don't know here is T5S. So now I know T5S, right? And if this was variable specific heat, I would do something similar where I would say that um, PR5S divided by PR4 is equal to P5 over P4, right? And this again is one over R. So the only thing I don't know here is PR5S when I find that, I'm going to go to table A22, and I'm going to interpolate moving from right to left on the table to find H5S. And if I want it, um, T5S. Right? So now here I have T5S and H5S. Uh, I apologize if this makes anybody queasy. We'll go back here. And now I know this. I know T5S. And I know H5S, which means that from here, I just found, right? Now, this was the only thing I don't know, and this was the only thing I don't know. But when I have H5, potentially, I don't think that I need to, but I could. Well, let's roll the dice, right? It's the exam. We don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to do any interpolation for this yet. If I need to do it, I'll come back to it. But why do the interpolation if you don't necessarily think you need to, right? Because it takes time. And right, an exam is kind of a marks per minute kind of kind of problem, right? So now we have T5 and H5. Now the cool thing about having T5 and H5 is that now we can come back to the regenerator. See now, 
I know T5 and I know H5. And because of that, I can find T3 and H3. So, so now I have found all of these temperatures, except the last one, all of the H values, except the last one. We know all the PRs, at least in um, the places that we need them, right? So now we can go back to our thermal efficiency equations, right? And now I know all of these, right? The only one I don't know is H6, right? And at least as this question is asked, I don't need H6. So I can find the thermal efficiency. It also asks for the net power, I think in horsepower. So to get the net power, you multiply the numerator by M dot, right? And then you'll have to do some kind of unit conversion. But if I was going to ask this problem on a test, right, I probably would want you to demonstrate your ability to find this exhaust temperature. So let's pretend that this question also asks us what T6 is, right? So what is the exhaust temperature? Right, so now we're talking about the regenerator, right? We have what was it, state two coming in here, state three coming in here, right, that's moving this way. We have state five coming in here and state six coming in here. And I don't know anything about uh, T6, but you know, all of these things have environmental regulations and knowing that the, you know, you can't probably exceed a particular outlet temperature, right? So how do I do this, right? And the answer, uh, maybe not surprisingly, or if you get stuck on an exam, <laughs> Pick a component and do a first law analysis, right? So the answer from this is going to come from the first law. DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in H in plus. If you're just going to cancel them out, uh, you can just say KE1 or KE in uh, plus PE in. This doesn't really help you if it's a turbojet problem. M dot out. H out plus K E out plus P E out, right? Here for this component, we're going to say that it's steady state, that it's passive, that even though heat is transferring this way, none of it go, goes over our boundary. So we're going to say that it's adiabatic. We're going to neglect kinetic and potential energy. There are more than one inlet and more than one outlet, right? So here, this is going to be zero is equal to on the cold side, M dot, times H2 minus H3 plus M dot on the hot side, H5 minus H6. Now, when you do problems like this, sometimes those two mass flow rates are different. But in this case, because this is all sort of daisy chained together, right? These things are all connected. So there's only one mass flow rate here, right? So here, because there's only one mass flow rate, the thing that we don't know Right, so we know uh, H2, 3, and 5. We don't know H6. Um, I can divide both sides of this equation by the mass flow rate. Zero divided by the mass flow rate is still just zero. So now I can isolate this. H6 is equal to H2 minus H3 plus H5. If this was constant specific heat at this point, if this is constant specific heat, here I would say zero is equal to Cp times T2 minus T3 plus T5 minus T6, right? I can divide both sides by Cp and I can isolate for T6. I get the same equation, but no, the H's become uh, T's. But to me, it's weird to go from this equation down to this equation directly because it's that, um, you know, there, there's not enough deltas, right? Because there's like an odd number on both sides. So I would, I would go to constant specific heat at this part of the equation so that I can make both of these delta H's Cp times delta T. So that is how you do that problem if... You got one that was more complicated, like the, the final version, 
right, that had intercooling and had um, reheat. The difference is you do the compressors twice and you do the turbines twice. And the thing that I, for me, and this is kind of silly because it's called reheat. So you wouldn't think I would screw this up. But for me, if I'm going to screw up a reheat problem, it's that I forget that I've got to take the sum of all the heat transfers in. So in reheat, there's two places, where, right? So in the complicated version, there's two turbines, two compressors, and two places where we add heat. For me, it's this one that's tough. So I think if you get a Brayton cycle problem like this, you got to remember which of the processes are isentropic. So you look for the ideal turbines and compressors. I think it's better to do the ideal versions before the real versions. If you do the real versions first, you'll get stuck, but that's okay. You just remember, you go back and do the ideal ones next. Then you got to remember how to do the regenerator efficiency. And when you do the regenerator, if you just start from state one and come up to before the turbine, right out of the regenerator, you get stuck. You won't have enough information for that, depending on what's given on the state table. But that's okay. You can just leave it and go to the next place where you have a temperature and a pressure, which is usually the inlet to the turbine. So that's generally how you do Brayton cycle problems. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a bit if people still have questions. Um, for the uh, Rankin cycle, uh, problem if we we're going to do a Rankin cycle, Rankin cycle uh, example on Thursday or Friday. Yes. Um, I, I might have found a, a good problem, uh, and I can email it to you beforehand uh, if that sounds good so that you have it at the be beginning of class. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea then. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michael, I saw that you unmuted and, um, and I saw your lips moving, but I didn't hear what you said. So I still can't hear you. I don't know if you can type it in the in the chat. No. At least my lip reading was, "Can you hear me?" But I didn't. Uh, but if you can, so if you can type it in the chat, that might be helpful. Thanks. Sorry about that. I don't know why. I don't know why that's the case. Yeah, it, it, might, it could be. Oh, you too. Thank you. Uh, you have a have a good day. <laughs> awesome. Have a good one. Does anybody else have uh, thermo questions? Um. So I, I had a question about um, a grade, actually. Sure. Um, would now be a good time? Um. um <clears throat> sure. Just let, oh, thanks. Um. And then actually, just a just a general question. Yep. Um. There was a question in uh, quiz. Uh, it was either quiz nine or ten um, that asked if the pressure at the exit of the turbine um, was the same as the um, pressure at the inlet of the compressor in a turbojet. Yeah. And in a regular Brayton cycle, those pressures are equal. Yes. But in a turbojet, they're not. They're not. Yes. So a Brayton cycle looks something like this, right? I'll just draw the four component version. I guess it's only three components, right? So here, this is uh, outside, right? It's pulling in air from outside, and this is also outside. So both of these, right? So this is state one, state two, state three, state four. Both of these things, one of the things you'll learn in fluid mechanics is that if you're taking a jet of a fluid from a reservoir, then the pressure is the same. But also if you have a jet of fluid going out into a reservoir, it's the same. So because both of these two things touch the outside, the pressures are the same. Now in a turbojet, it's a little bit the same, but also a little bit different. So in a turbojet, we have a diffuser first, and then a compressor, and then we have a combustor, and then we have a turbine, and then we have 
a nozzle. We'll, we'll pretend that's a nozzle, right? So it is the same in that the two states, right? So this is state, I, they call it A, I think. One, two, three, four, five. So it is the same that PA is equal to P5 because they both touch the atmosphere, right? It is not the same that P1 is equal to P4 because now they neither of these two things is touching the atmosphere. There's no reason why they have to be the same. And the reason that we ask this question in the quiz is because when we look at the Brayton cycle in here, right, when you get to this state three, you're going to have to ask yourself how to fix state four. And if it was a Brayton cycle, right, you'd, maybe you'd hear, uh, you know, your little doctor shirts are on your shoulder saying, oh, which ones are the isentropic processes, right? And you would say, oh, if this is an isentropic process and the pressure here at state four is the same as state one, then I can use that isentropic relationship. The problem is the pressure is not the same and we have no idea what this pressure is, right? So here, when we're solving the turbine power, it's that the back work ratio is equal to one. I'm sure we will talk about this tomorrow, but this is a very common mistake that people make on these turbojet problems because this is a thing, it's a bit of a wrinkle because it's different than a Brayton cycle, right? So the trick is we have to make it so the back work ratio is one. Okay, all right, that makes sense. And then you could, if you fix the state that way and the problem asks you what the pressure at state four was, because that's something I can ask you, right? Then after you use the back work ratio is one, you'd use this to find H5 and then you could use table A22 to find PR5. And then you could say that, oh, if I had an isentropic turbine, uh, PR4 over PR5 is equal to P4 over P5. And then you could find B5, if a problem okay. ever ever wanted you to know that. I think there was actually a problem just like that in the, uh, the homework, mm -hmm. homework 10. So it's, so it's still the same equations. It's just you, you sort of chain them together in a different way. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. Awesome. Have a good one. Question. You too. Uh, I also had another question, like uh, something yep. else. Uh, so I, uh, I think it was during the homework that it was asking for like a uh, like, uh, vapor compression system mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our refrigeration system. And what happened was that... Um, it, it said that air entered in the evaporator and then gave us a mass flow rate, but by the end, it was like when I was looking at the solution, it did something completely different with two different mass flow rates to get the mass flow rate of the cycle. Oh, because and I think what happens is, so that one, is that the one that's got a picture of like a, like a window air conditioner and it doesn't really help you? Very yeah. Much? yeah. 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 So, here we got to remember that, um, no, it's an air conditioner, right? Right, so this is the cold side of the air conditioner, right? Um, so what's happening there is this is T air in, and this is T air out, right? And then this is the, right? So what's happening here, right, is heat is going from this hot temperature, right? So this comes in at the air temperature, right? So maybe this is something like, I don't know, 20 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit, right? And then it's going to come out at something less, right? Let's say it's maybe 14 degrees Celsius or something over here. So now, if you know the mass flow rate through here, right? So if we're ever trying to find a mass flow rate, there's really only three ways we know how to do it, right? This is area times velocity over specific volume, which is the same thing as V dot over specific volume. Or if we know a place where we have Q dot or W dot, then we can do the first law. Or we look for a place that has more than one in and more than one out, right? So here we're going to do a first law analysis here because there's a mass flow rate of air and there's also a mass flow rate of the refrigerant. And if we did the first law on this particular component, right, we'd see that DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in H in 
plus b in squared over 2 plus gz in minus the sum of m dot out h out plus v out squared over 2 plus gz out. For this component, we'd say it's at steady state. It's adiabatic. It's passive. It is adiabatic, right? Because there is heat transfer, but we're assuming none of it escapes the component. It's not one in that one outlet, but there is no kinetic or potential energy. So here we get that zero is equal to uh, the sum of m dot in h in minus the sum of m dot out h out. I'm going to group these because m dot r is different potentially than m dot air. So I'm going to group these into air and, and uh, refrigerant. So here I'm going to say m dot of the air, right, is equal to uh, h in, right? So this would be h, I don't know, uh, let's call this 5 in this state 6. h5 minus h6 plus m dot of the refrigerant, h in is state 4, H4 minus H1, right? Now, probably I would uh, uh, use constant specific heat here, right? So this would probably become zero is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times Cp, T5 minus T6 plus M dot of the refrigerant, H4 minus H1. Now, typically, in a case like this, uh, you know, we'll know CP, we'll either be given these things or maybe we'll know what they are, right? And we know the H's, right? And we'll know one of the mass flow rates, but not the other one. Or sometimes maybe they'll ask us for a ratio of mass flow rates, right? But here, if I knew M dot air, then I could find M dot of the refrigerant, right? If I knew all this other stuff, if I could fix these states. Or if they gave me the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, I could find the mass flow rate of the air. Okay, yeah, no, I, I definitely got confused when I looked at that on the solution. I was like, I don't know what they did here, but I'm just going to stick to my original answer because I definitely don't know how to get this one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, okay, now I get it. I think um, part of the take-home message from this question is draw useful figures. So um, throughout the rest of your university career, you will, um, you know, you'll have a lot of lab reports or you'll write a lot of other reports. And in this picture or in this question, I think the figure is like a sketch of a window air conditioner, right? Which doesn't help anybody. But if you had a sketch like this that showed what the cycle actually looked like, then I think intuitively it would make more sense. I think you'd have a better chance of getting to the answer. Uh, I guess my last question would be, like, how do we know what in the cycle is constant pressure? Because you said in the, with the question we just did, like, everything was basically constant pressure to pressure one, but because it was the, uh, the ratio, you had to, like, multiply it by 10. Unless you're otherwise told, I think it's fair to say that pressure changes in open systems, that pressure changes in compressors, in pumps. That's where pressure goes up. And pressure changes in turbines, that's where pressure goes down. Anything in between there is going to be like, um, you know, lines that are connecting things and heat transfer devices. And, uh, um, you know, we assume that pressure change is, is constant there, that, that the change in pressure is not really that important. I guess the other thing that wasn't on that list is uh, here in these refrigeration cycles, um, these expansion valves are basically the same thing as turbines in terms of pressure in that the pressure drops across the expansion valve. So really any time the heat transfer term sticks around, uh, that's too general because you can't have heat loss from a compressor or something, right? But um, any time you're going through a turbine or a compressor or an expansion valve or a pump, you expect the pressure to change Generally, outside of that, you don't expect it to change um, unless you're otherwise told. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. okay. Thank you, Professor. I'll see you tomorrow, and I hope I, I, I'm bringing in a, a pretty good question. Sounds good. I'm sure it'll be so, good. It's, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's, oh, it's hopefully valuable to kind of see me go through it in real time. So hopefully that helps. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. You're welcome. You too, Sebastian.